Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing how to become a thriving entrepreneur. Uh, Precious Nyarambi, uh, the author of the book, Thriving Entrepreneurs, uh, is supposed to join us, but uh, at the moment, she's traveling and she's having connectivity problems. So she might join us or she may not, she may, she might or she may not join us, but I would proceed uh, either way. You can uh, type in any questions that uh, you have um, regarding the discussion. If you have any comments that are relevant to what we are discussing this afternoon, you can also type in. I would appreciate if I uh, have uh, encouraging comments for others to, to read, for those who will read later. You also encourage you to share and take somebody. You can share the, the video to as many people as you can think so that uh, we grow together as we pursue our dreams. And today with me is Temba. Temba is a real-owned conference speaker, trainer and consultant in risk management, strategic planning and uh, financial advisory is the founder of Duplex Institute. Uh, 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 Temba has uh, traveled around Africa, training and consulting, and has gone as far as Dubai. So he's uh, an experienced uh, businessman. Uh, Temba, normally we start by sharing the financial news. Would you want to share with our viewers uh, what's uh, trending in the finance uh, sector? Thanks, Tafadzwa. I'm hoping that Precious will be able to join us so that we can have a great discussion about how to thrive as an entrepreneur. But uh, I understand that she's having connectivity problems, but even if she doesn't you know, join us, um we appreciate you know that she offered herself to share experiences we normally start these uh, sessions with just discussing some news that are quite topical um particularly those kinds of news that have to do with our you know personal finances and i would want to raise three things um Chafadzwa. the first thing that i would want to raise is you know, and this this mainly concerns um, um, you know consumers in in South Africa. In this week, we had um, you know one bank publishing their financial results, and the name of the bank is called African Bank. What drew my attention is how their provisions have increased by two hundred and forty percent. So when we talk about provisions. Uh, what banks do is that if they think that customers will not likely to be able to meet their obligations, they set aside, you know, profits to cover for those, you know, for that eventuality. So we have seen in the past two months, banks increasing their provisions. In fact, when African Bank reported um, in this particular half year, they reported a loss. Uh, obviously, the loss was as a result of a number of things, but it, one of the factors had to do with um, the extent to which people are starting to default on their loans. And that just gives us an idea into the state of the consumer in South Africa. I think NetBank last week also um, published some information to the effect that they are also increasing um, their provisions. So what does it mean to our audience? What it means is that particularly in South Africa, and I'm sure it would be applicable to you know, other consumers as well in Europe and also in Southern Africa, um, the consumer is not in a great place at the moment. Uh, households are stretched in terms of their budgets, and we're seeing people starting to default on their loans. There are, there are two implications for me. Number one, I think we need to use you know, our money very, very cautiously. We need to budget 
we need we do not need to go into you know borrowings not at this time of the of the cycle the second implication is that um it's also an opportunity for people to create wealth um you know particularly on the property front you know there might be people defaulting and i suspect that in the coming two three months you know banks are going to be opening options to auction properties so if you are an investor i think it's a huge opportunity so the first thing to is just the state of the the consumer um i think the consumer is actually stretched um and i hope there won't be any further interest rate hikes because that will serve no other purpose but to worsen the pain that households are experiencing at the moment. The second thing that I would want to just bring to the attention of our viewers is you know, the relief that consumers have experienced in this particular month, you know, particularly, or in this particular week, so we had an announcement in South Africa that um, fuel was going to go down. So I think petrol is going down by something like 71 cents and diesel by something like um, 680 cents. And that's essentially because of um, the low uh, energy, I mean, fuel prices, you know, globally. We've also seen that in this week, the rand is strengthened by 4%. You know, last week people were crying about the rand going towards, you know, 20 to the US dollar. Um, so we've seen quite a little bit of strengthening, you know, at the moment. Um, I think it during the year, during this week, it actually gained by something like, uh, you know, 4%. In addition to that, um, we've seen an improvement on the load shedding front. Uh, many people were expecting that it would be disaster, you know, with winter. My view is that we must not relax. It could be the calm before the storm. Uh, we have to bank whatever relief comes our way. So if the pet fuel price, you know, comes down, normally what happens is that when these kinds of relief come our way, sometimes people, you know, relax. Remember what I say you know, households are experiencing a lot of pain. If there is a relief that temporarily comes, whether it's, you know, from the rand strengthening or it is from fuel prices coming down, we must continue saving. Um, I, I've been advocating for, for savings, that we must have a discipline when it comes to savings. So whatever relief comes our way, I foresee that there will be continual pain, you know, out there. And so it could be that the relief, you know, may be short-lived. And then I picked the story. This story comes from China, Tafadzwa. Uh, I was just going through some of the press in China. Um, I think it's coming from a province called Henan in China. And they reported a story of a 13-year-old girl who was addicted to online games. Um, as you know, the Chinese are on a crackdown. They're trying to crack down all and introducing quite, you know, some strict um, legislation for gaming companies. But the, 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 the news was that this 13 year old, um, she was addicted to games. And what happened is that she just spotted a debit card uh, in her home. And this debit card belonged to the mother. And she then linked this debit card to a smartphone. And the mother at some point had disclosed the password of this debit order. And so she started purchasing games online. And within a week, she had squandered something like 1.2 million runs um, just buying games. Obviously, she went to school and bought games for 10 of her friends uh, as well. So I don't want to talk about the parenting side of the story. That's a story for another day. I want to focus on what the girl said when um, you know, she was interviewed. Um, in her own words, you know, she didn't have an idea of where money comes from. You know, so that statement came out quite clearly from her mouth. You know, I don't have an idea of where money comes from. Um, and, you know, 
And that got me thinking, at what age do we start to tell our kids about the value of a rand, the value of a dollar, so that they know where money comes from and they don't just squander money, you know, just like that. Um, because in this particular scenario, it was that scenario where, um, you know, obviously there is an addiction side of it, but, you know, you've got a young person who has no idea where money comes from and how the parents would have, you know, labored for these savings, because these are family savings that she actually squandered. And um, even for that kind of household, 1.2 million is not a small amount of, of money. So there are two things that I'm saying there. The first thing that I'm saying is that for those of us who are parents, I think it's very important to give this kind of financial education to children from an early age. And I think we had a session about that at some stage, um, you know, Tafadzwa, because that's very, very important. But also the second thing I could not figure out, um, even from the mom's point of view, how she would not have noticed that 1.2 million has left here you know, credit card for that particular week. And it got me thinking about how sometimes we don't monitor what's happening on our bank accounts. Um, I've gotten into the habit of, you know, scrutinizing bank statements and making sure that I get notifications, not only on what is happening on my bank account, but also what is happening on my on my credit report, there is a lot of fraud going out, you know, out there. And it's very important that we have ways of just checking our balances, just checking what's happening to our credit reports. And to go for a week without noticing that 1.2 million has left one's bank account, it's just something that, it's not a family that has got a lot of money, by the way. If she had billions of dollars, probably 1.2 million would not have been material. But this is a family who, you know, of that 1.2 million, probably, you know, a material amount of the savings, you know, would have been, would have been eroded. So, the one thing that I'm bringing to our attention, apart from the fact that we must pass on this knowledge to our children, is how we must be monitoring our bank accounts, how we must be monitoring our credit records, you know, so that we don't just lose money, you know, just like that. In fact, you may be interested to know, Tafadzo, how the mom actually, you know, got to know this. Um, the teachers at school actually noticed that this girl was always on her cell phone and she wasn't, you know, focusing on her studies. And then they reported it to her mom. And only after, you know, quite a lot of interrogation, quite a lot of, you know, questions being asked, was it then discovered that this 1.2 million had actually left the bank account. And it's something that could have been stopped, you know, much earlier on. It's also, you know, speaks to putting limits onto transactions. Um, it's very important so that we can, we can, you know, guard against not only children abusing credit cards, but also criminals, you know, abusing criminal, you know, abusing uh, credit cards as well. It's very important to put limits, get notifications so that we can um, stop, you know, transactions from, you know, going on further. Um, so those are the issues that I would want to bring to our attention, you know, Tafadzo. Uh, overall, what I'm saying is I see quite a lot of pain uh, going forward. There will be relief coming here and there. We must bank all that relief that comes our way and, you know, continue with the, you know, good habits that we have acquired over time. Over to you, Tafadzo. Uh, thank you very much, Chamber. As you were speaking, I was just uh, remembering a story I heard on the radio where a mom went with a child to the shops and the child uh, picked something from the shop and uh, didn't pay for it. And the mom had to take the child to the police station. So I um, was just wondering when you're sharing about the Chinese story, whether that would have been an option to also take the child to the police, maybe because 
the child knew that she was using the parent's card. So it was just a thought. Uh, anyway, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Precious. Uh, in Precious's book, uh, The Entre um, Thriving Entrepreneur, she states that her purpose is based um, amid of frustrations and challenges of life and grows with the, every bridge we must tra traverse. Peoples can easily become our primary love and influences the many different relationships we, we find along the journey of life. One finds when fullness and commitment in purpose, if, pe if pursued. Normally when people talk about entrepreneurship, we talk about uh, the fulfillment it, uh, it brings along. And we've noticed many people start small. Someone is saying, uh, they don't like the term small business because many people have uh, become comfortable. They start a small business and remain a small business. So they wish there was a, um, another name that could be given these businesses. And she was also mentioning that when uh, his, his mom was uh, doing the Stockville uh, when Absa started, but uh, his mom remained a a small, a small business person because they remained as a stock view and never grew. But now, Absa has many branches. And I was saying that that's the difference between uh, the mentality that we have as small business people. We remain small, but those who started Absa, they didn't start, they didn't have the small business mentality. That's how they ended up having many branches in um, in in the country. And based on, on that, why would someone aim to be thriving as an entrepreneur? Because we know there are so many small businesses. Everyone is starting small, but no one, not many people move from being small businesses to being thriving entrepreneurs. Thanks, Tefadzo. Before I answer your question, you're talking about APSA there. Just to give you a little bit of history about APSA. Um, APSA, you know, is an acronym, A-B-S-A. -A. It stands for the Amalgamated Banks of, you know, of South Africa. It's, it's not one organization. It's essentially four banks that came together, you know, to merge, to form this big bank called, um, you know, called APSA. So it's not one organization that has grown um, organically to established you know, many banks. But I think your point still remains there. We must think big. And what you're just highlighting there is that probably there are two growth trajectories for entrepreneurs. You can grow organically or you can grow through acquisition, but growth is growth at the end of the day. I think we must have a growth mindset for us to be you know, thriving. So in answering your question, Tafadzo, I want to emphasize the importance of mindset, particularly a growth mindset. I think everyone who starts a business must actually have a, a growth mindset, you know, a mindset to grow and have something big. I don't have a problem when a business is called a small business, because what they are essentially talking about there is the size of the, of the turnover. We normally judge businesses by the turnover that they are producing. So if, you are in, in, if, if I were to use the categorization that is used you know, in South Africa, if you've got a turnover of less than 10 million, you are essentially a small business. And then if you go above that, you are becoming, you know, to be, you know, a sizable business. And then later on, you can become, you know, a corporate. Um, so, so size is judged, you know, based on, on turnover. But regardless of the size of the business, I think we must aim for big impact. So you might be a small business, but also try to have a huge, you know, you know impact. Your question, Tafadzo, was, you know, why should entrepreneur, entrepreneurs thrive? Um, why, why thriving entrepreneurs, which is the title of, uh, you know, Precious um, books, I would, uh, book. I would want to take a step, you know, backwards, you know, Tafadzo, and just also 
you know, make our viewers understand that, you know, entrepreneurs play a critical role in an economy. I was studying about the American economy and I got to understand that almost half of the US workforce is actually employed in the small to medium businesses. So these businesses that we are calling small actually account for you know, a large population of the workforce. So we need to understand that entrepreneurs can actually solve the unemployment problem. In South Africa, we've got a huge unemployment problem. So why should entrepreneurs thrive? Entrepreneurs should thrive because you know, they help to accelerate economic growth. They help to create uh, employment in an economy. I don't think government will solve necessarily all the employment wars that we have in many countries. The solution lies with entrepreneurs starting businesses, no matter how small you know, they are. Um, there is a statement in the Bible which says that do not despise, you know, um, you know, small beginnings. And, and I don't think we must despise somebody who starts small. Some of these businesses, such as Microsoft, started in garages and they grew, you know, to be what they are at the moment. I think the entrepreneurs, they had a growth mindset. You know, they were driven by a vision. They understood that they were there, you know, to solve, you know, problem. So number one, entrepreneurs should thrive because they accelerate economic growth. Entrepreneurs also solve problems through innovation. Um, when I look around, I see quite a lot of challenges, you know, whether it's load shedding in South Africa, uh, whether it's climate change in all the countries, you know, and I think entrepreneurs can solve those problems through, you know, innovation, um, because that's essentially what, you know, entrepreneurship, you know, is all about. Innovation is the cornerstone of, of entrepreneurship. And then number three, entrepreneurs drive social change. So we need thriving entrepreneurs in any economy to drive social change, to solve problems through innovation and to accelerate you know, economic you know, growth. From a personal point of view, I think thriving also has got quite a number of benefits for the entrepreneurs themselves. Remember, and, and this is what motivated me when I started a business, entrepreneurs start a business so that they may create an asset of value, which they can sell at some point. And I think where people, you know, struggle is getting to a stage where they create an asset of value, which somebody might be interested to invest, um, you know, in. So why should entrepreneurs, you know, thrive? They should thrive because their business is essentially their pension. Their business is essentially the asset of value that they will create and, you know, create tremendous wealth, you know, out of. If they are not thriving, then they will be worse off than anybody else because their pension would have gone up in flames. So I think at a personal level, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship provides an opportunity to the entrepreneurs themselves to create tremendous amounts of wealth, but also to grow in the process as, um, as individual. So thriving entrepreneurs, very good for the economy, very good for the entrepreneurs. Um, themselves as well, Tefazo. Uh, thank you for highlighting that. Uh, entrepreneurs accelerate innovation. They solve problems. So do not be discouraged if you're small. Uh, it's, uh, everyone started small. Uh, even those we have, uh, we have multi-billionaire uh, businesses, we hear some started in garages, some started in their, uh, in their lounges. So you have to start from, from somewhere. Yeah, in uh, thriving entrepreneurs, uh, precious also mentioned that uh, some, some challenges, uh, 
that shares experience in a, in a business, like not being paid by clients, have uh, really had uh, at some point even left her in some real uh, trouble, uh, serious trouble by stakeholders. Uh, Timba, how we have, um, how do challenges help uh, entrepreneurs to thrive? Uh, normally, when you talk about entrepreneurs, we talk about the success story when they get there. But uh, we don't talk about the journey between starting in a garage to being a multi-billionaire, um, building a multi-billion um, business. How do challenges build uh, build people uh, in their businesses or build the? And what 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 um, does challenges being an entrepreneur mean in your world as an as an entrepreneur? Thank you for that question, Tafadzwa. Today we're talking about mindset and we're talking about the mindset of not giving up, the mindset of, of perseverance. I think it takes quite a lot of mental strength to be a thriving you know, entrepreneur because the world is becoming more and more uncertain. But not only is it becoming more and more uncertain, it's becoming also, you know, very, very, you know, risky. So let's just talk about some of the challenges that entrepreneurs come across. You've spoken about, you know, cash flow challenges, you know, people not paying on time. Um, I heard of a business in one province in South Africa, which was not paid, you know, by the government for an entire year. And by the time that the invoice was released, they had actually gone under. So that's a huge challenge that entrepreneurs have to come across. In fact, Tafadzo, um, statistics tell us, I think the University of the Western Cape in South Africa did a study here, and they found out that 70 to 80% of the small businesses fail within the first uh, you know, five years. That's a huge number. That's a huge you know, failure rate. And that failure rate is essentially attributable to businesses running out of cash. You know, people just give up on this entrepreneurial journey. because they've they've just run out of cash so that's challenge number one the other challenge it relates to competition i think we're seeing quite a lot of competitive activity we have seen disruptors come into the market so it's actually possible to start a business in one you know market and probably to start to do well only to find out that in the second third year of your business Another competitor is actually coming and, you know, they are, you know, eating your lunch, you know, so to speak. Think of businesses, Tafazo, like Blackberry, you know, how <laughs> many people don't, understand, don't, don't realize this. But at one point, Blackberry had 80% of the smartphone market share in South Africa. And, you know, the first messaging service that you probably used, Tafazo, was BBM only for WhatsApp to come. And, and in fact, for some people who, who might be, you know, who were young during that time, there was quite an innovation, a messaging innovation in South Africa called, the, I think, Mix It or something like that, um, which young people were using before WhatsApp. And then WhatsApp came 
and then all of those businesses die. So part of the challenge as well is competitive activity, where you've got disruptors you know, coming into the market. Another challenge is economic challenges. You know, sometimes economies go, you know, through recession. And I think, you know, we, we're going through some kind of technical recession in South Africa. The Eurozone is already in, in recession. So when you go through recession, your customers stop buying from you. Your revenue goes down. Probably your costs still remain, you know, what they are. That's another challenge. Then you've got you know, the kind of challenges that we are experiencing at the moment, which have to do with load shedding, you know, or even challenges that we experienced in July 2021 in South Africa, which had to do with social unrest. So when one becomes an intrapreneur, they need to understand that there are challenges out there you know, in business. But in my mind, an entrepreneur is somebody who spots a gap in the market, somebody who takes risk so that they may profit from the risk. And one quality that by far separates entrepreneurs from those that are not real entrepreneurs or that are not serial entrepreneurs is their ability to persevere in spite of, um, of challenges. You might have heard a quote by you know, I think it, this quote is attributable to, you know, to Thomas Edison. He said that I have not failed. I've just found, you know, 10,000 ways you know, that won't work. And, and I think that's a great mindset there. You know, they will be failures. Uh, I normally say to my, to my team, Tafadzwa, at Duplex Institute, and it's true. The kind of business that we are having at the moment is what I would call duplex version four. We had version one of duplex, which actually collapsed and we were kicked out of offices you know, elsewhere. Then we had another version of duplex, which collapsed as well. Uh, then we had version three, you know, we had to pick up things from the ashes and start again. So the, the business that we have actually, which we are calling duplex institute at the moment, is version four of, of duplex. And I'm not the only entrepreneur who has gone through, you know, you know, even bankruptcies and still standing. And, and if you look at other entrepreneurs, I don't have time to, you know, talk about other entrepreneurs and, um, and what they have done. But I think, you know, challenges have got tangible benefits to an entrepreneur. And I would want to talk about, you know, three, three, you know, tangible benefits of challenges to an entrepreneur. Number one, you innovate, you know, because we are experiencing challenges, whether that challenge is um, in the internal environment of the business or in the external environment of the business, you are always trying to innovate. And I would want to, for those of us who are entrepreneurs, just highlight the importance of creating a culture of innovation within the business. Because innovation will help us to evolve our business models and to deal with some of the challenges and, and therefore to continue having businesses that are always you know, relevant. So challenges by themselves help entrepreneurs to innovate. Challenges by themselves also help employ, you know, entrepreneurs to grow. I cannot tell you how I have grown as a person. I'm talking about cash flow problems, you know, Tafadzo. I, I, when I went into entrepreneurship, I could not negotiate with suppliers. You know, now I've learned to negotiate. I have sharpened my negotiation skills like never before. And it's essentially because, and the, the reason why I was able to sharpen my negotiation skills is because of some of the cash flow challenges that we've had in our business. And so before I even deliver my, my service, <laughs> one of the questions that I asked, which is the question that you would have been asked Tafadzwa, in most of these retail outlets is, how do you intend to pay for this service? And when are you going to pay? So, so you learn to ask direct questions, you learn to negotiate, 
and you grow you know as a person i have grown as a person in terms of emotional intelligence and in many dimensions as well and that growth would not have been possible had i not encountered challenges i've also grown even in terms of faith and I can tell you now and testify that I'm not the kind of person who panics easily. You know, when things go wrong, I've learned to be calm. I've learned to think systematically through problems and try to find the root cause. And one of the, you know, problem solving techniques that I have developed over time is what I would call root cause analysis. So if there is a challenge, I try to draw on a diagram and say, why is this happening? Why is it happening? Because I will not be able to go forward if I can't diagnose what the problem you know, is. So I've learned to think clearly, not to panic, even in certain situations where ordinarily I would have, um, you know, I would have, you know, uh, panicked. But also, you know, the third thing about, you know, let's just say the upside of challenges, because challenges or problems by themselves have got a downside. And the downside is to do with things such as, you know, they are demotivating. Uh, but there's also an upside, which I would want to, you know, highlight, which is, you know, very, very, you know, important. I have, you know, learned to be optimistic, you know, Tafazo. Um, sometimes if you are not an entrepreneur, you know, you haven't survived anything, you think the world is falling apart. But I have learned that, you know, even though morning may endure for some season, but joy is coming in the morning. And, and, and the reason why I'm, I'm optimistic throughout all the challenges, you cannot convince me for one minute that the world is falling apart. You can give me statistics of you know, what is going wrong, but because of the challenges that I have had and that I have survived, I've just learned to be you know, very optimistic and know that there is light at the end of the channel. And I guess it's a mindset issue, you know, Tafazo. You can't go forward if you can't diagnose the problem. And uh, you have spoken a lot about mindset, uh, Timba, uh, as an entrepreneur. There's a question that uh, I've heard people asking before. Are entrepreneurs born or made? Because some can really uh, go through the challenges and survive. So if I'm an entrepreneur and I get to a point where I give up, should I feel condemned or I should just accept that maybe I was not made for this? Are there some people who have eaten their journey that they are supposed to be entrepreneurs or everyone can be an entrepreneur as long as you work on it, on the mindset? And um, doesn't that also, uh, like some people thrive probably because they were born entrepreneurs. Can we say that's different, different that others can be made, others are born, are they born or made? Um, and how does that affect being the thriving entrepreneur? Um, it's, 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 an, it's, it's an interesting question, um, Tafadzwa. Um, are entrepreneurs born or are they made? Um, I think it's 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 both uh, Jafadzwa. Uh, one can make the argument that entrepreneurs are actually met. Um, and the reason why we can make that argument is number one, think of people who grow in an entrepreneurial family. I have seen, you know, what we what we sometimes you know don't don't interrogate enough is where this entrepreneur is coming from. Um, you will actually see that some of the people that you think are great entrepreneurs were actually mentored by their fathers in a family setup. And, you know, their father might have had a small business, but they took the idea to the next level. And one of the things that I have actually observed 
is that in entrepreneurial families where there is a culture of entrepreneurship, the children actually end up being entrepreneurs themselves because of what they have learned, because of you know, what they were taught when they were young. And the same would go to, I'm sure you've heard about footballing families where the father was a footballer and the children also end up being, you know, uh, footballers, you know, as well. That to me says that entrepreneurs can be met. They're not necessarily born because they have been raised in an environment which has enabled them to be, you know, who they are. The other thing that I would want to point out is that there are a number of universities that are teaching entrepreneurial course. I wouldn't imagine for a minute that those universities will be teaching entrepreneurs if they were not convinced that entrepreneurs can actually be met. The reason why entrepreneurs can be met is because we can actually do case study upon case study of why people fail as entrepreneurs, of the qualities that make good entrepreneurs and reduce all that into a body of knowledge which would enable people to become better you know, entrepreneurs. So I think from that point of view, I'm totally convinced that entrepreneurs can actually uh, be met. You can train somebody to be you know, an entrepreneur. There is very little entrepreneurial activity that happens you know, in certain countries. It's not because that population is not necessarily entrepreneur. They may be entrepreneurial at their own level, but what we need to do is to teach and equip them with skills that would enable them to take entrepreneurship um, to the next level. But also an argument can be made that entrepreneurs are actually you know, born. And the reason has to do with qualities such as you know, innovation, qualities such as perseverance, you know, by nature, you know, people are wired, entrepreneurs are wired by nature to take high risks. You know, they are high risk takers uh, by nature. They spot opportunities, they then go for it. And, and those are qualities that, you know, one can argue, you know, somebody is actually born with the ability to take risks. I have read of stories of people who, took extraordinary risks. Uh, you know, think of the Elon Musk of this world. You know, somebody would have a dream of, you know, building spaceships to Mars and, you know, have all these futuristic dreams that he has. I think there is an element where one can actually say, you know, they are born because they are individuals who have done outstanding things. And, and one could argue that, you know, it happened because, you know, they were born, you know, that way. So to me, it's both. Uh, that should not discourage us. I think even if you don't feel cut out to be an entrepreneur, I think you can learn entrepreneurship and you can be very good at it and be very successful at entrepreneurship. Thank you for that uh, encouragement uh, that uh, even if you are you're not coming from a generation of entrepreneurs, you can still make it by even going to study and uh, working on your mindset and um, being knowledgeable. Temba, you spoke about uh, competition. Tendai is asking, how do you handle a situation where your competitor continuously takes your experience employees and you end up having to retrain all the time? <laughs> That's a very, very great question, um, um, Chafadzo. It's, it's a great question. Um, let me just make a statement here, and I'm making this statement from experience. What makes great organizations is great cultures. Um, you know, there is, every organization has got a hard way, but it's also got a soft way. Uh, and that software has to do with the culture of, of the organization. Um, and what I would want to emphasize, apart from mindset, is of entrepreneurs creating great cultures within organizations. 
And, and let me just make this clear, Tafazo. I might seem not to be answering your question, but I will get there. This thing that we call organizational culture is a culture that has been instilled by the entrepreneurs themselves. The organization takes a character after the entrepreneur themselves, and that shapes the organizational culture. You've heard a statement that says culture will eat strategy for breakfast at any time. I think one of the things that will cause organizations to really prosper and thrive is the outstanding culture in that organization. So we must have a culture of innovation. We must have a culture of empowering people. We must have a culture of you know, developing people. Let's not talk about what competitors are doing. Let's work on building those cultures within our organization. Cultures of valuing people. When you've got that, I think you have almost you know, protected your business from competitive you know, activity. I do not know of any organization that is sustainably grown by poaching people from you know, skilled people. They may experience you know, success for some time, but that will not be sustainable in the long term because what sustains organization in the long term, what causes organization to wither storms is great cultures that have been you know, um, you know, created over time within that organization. I've also come across organizations that do not pay much, but employees are loyal in that organization. And even competitors cannot poach them uh, because of you know, the great culture that is within that organization. So I'm putting three ideas on the table. Number one, let's create great cultures in our organizations as, um, as intrapreneurs, you know, culture of developing people, culture of innovation, culture of valuing people, so that people stay in those organizations. When we do that, we've sort of protected the organization from, um, you know, employees, um, you know, being, you know, being tempted, you know, to go uh, elsewhere. Secondly, let's also identify talent. Tafadzwa, <laughs> uh, many entrepreneurs don't do this, but um, there is a formal way of managing talent in an organization. You need to identify your key people who are really talented and will take the organization uh, forward. When you have identified those people, you need to put in place a talent management program so as to retain uh, those people. So the second thing that I'm saying above, you know, in addition to culture, is you know really managing talent you know very well because if talent is not managed, it will go elsewhere where it's appreciated. So many organizations do not have formal ways of managing talent and realizing that you don't fight talent, you actually nature talent, and you've got you know, a career path for talent. The other thing that I would want to put on the table is that obviously there are legal ways of protecting ourselves, such as restraint of trade. One could also look at this so that our secrets uh, are not shared with other organization. So one is to look at all those legal ways of, of protecting ourselves. But before we even go to the legal ways, I think culture and formal talent management programs in an organization, I've also started in my organization to see the talented people. In, 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 in the same way, I've also exited people whose values and you know, whose beliefs are not consistent with the culture that we are creating at Duplex Institute. So that's how I would answer that question, Tafazo. Uh, thank you very much uh, about that. Uh, we mustn't be so worried about competition, but we need to create a culture that will uh, retain our employees or our team members. Uh, Temba, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs facing challenges uh, and they do not see how they don't have hope 
like where they are, they don't see how they can thrive. There they is really no hope in, but they're in, in business. Very good question. Uh, we've got a, quite a number of discouraged uh, you know, people out there. The first thing is that they need to diagnose what the problem is. Remember, I spoke about a root cause analysis. I think every challenge has got its own root causes. Um, and so it's very important that people know what the root cause of the challenge is. Before you can prescribe a solution, you need to know its root causes. You need to know why you've been, why you're having you know, those kinds of, uh, of, of challenges. And it may be useful to bring in an external party who sees things differently from outside in to say, look, this is my business. You know, can you look at it and, and see what challenges you know, I have? Some entrepreneurs don't ask for help. You know, they don't ask for consulting help. They don't ask for mentorship. So I'm advocating for mentorship here. I'm advocating for you know, external help. The reason why that help is very important is that you bring in people who can actually help you to think through. Because sometimes as an entrepreneur, you are so close to your challenges that you can't actually you know, think clearly and see you know, clearly what might be happening. In fact, as I have been able to help and coach entrepreneurs over time, I've actually said to some entrepreneurs, you are the problem in your the business. You are the problem. Because what we don't realize is that you could be good for the business for a season, but beyond that, the business can't grow and the business is experiencing challenges because of your own limitation as an entrepreneur. Because remember, we come with limitations. We've got limitations as, as entrepreneurs. So advice number one is seek help from external people who will be able to diagnose the problem. Advice number two is that look out for you know, mentorship and training opportunities to grow even out of you know, your challenges that you might be having. Advice number three, and this is um, you know, advice that came from a book, you know, Think and Grow Rich. They started advocating for this concept of uh, you know, masterminding, where you bring in like-minded you know, people who can brainstorm on ideas. So I would advocate for entrepreneurs not to fight these challenges on their own, but create mastermind groups where they can meet regularly, maybe on a monthly basis with other entrepreneurs. And out of that mastermind session, you know, there are things that can actually come out, you know, from, 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 from that, you know, particular, you know, um, session. Advice number four, if there is a skill that entrepreneurs must have over time is the skill of cash flow management. Yes, you know, entrepreneurs traditionally have had sales skills. I think it's very important for an entrepreneur to be able to sell. But one of the things that is often not talked about is, you know, cash flow management. I don't necessarily ask entrepreneurs to, um, to be accounting gurus. I don't ask entrepreneurs to be finance gurus, but I ask them to be able to manage cash flow and to have sort of a model of managing cash flows. Because at the end of the day, businesses collapse because they have run out of cash. So you are an entrepreneur, you are having challenges. I, in most, in 99% of the cases, it's a cash flow problem. You know, Tafazo, because that's what causes people. And so I would want to give entrepreneurs out there, you know, some ideas which I have learned, you know, over time, uh, which have, you know, actually, you know, helped me. You know, idea number one, always operate with a cash flow forecast. It's very important. Always operate with a cash flow forecast. Prepare a forecast of cash flows. 
and you know it will help you even in your spending patterns so that you don't spend money that you have not yet um, uh, received. And then the other thing is that learn to negotiate with your creditors. I have found myself, you know, in my entrepreneurial journey, owing rent, you know, but the landlords, some of the landlords that I have had have been lenient with me because I have been, you know, I've been, you know, I, I, I took the initiative to explain to them, as an entrepreneur, don't run away from challenges. That challenge could be a cash flow problem. Go and talk to all your creditors, explain to them what the situation is, play open books with your creditors. Some of the creditors can actually be able to finance you out of the challenges you know, that you are having, because that's very, very important. Every business needs to be funded. And one way of having that funding is you know, you know, creditors. Um, the other cash flow idea that I may want to give you is that send out invoices early. Finish your project, send out invoices early, bill early, because the sooner you bill, the sooner your clients will be able to, um, to pay. Sometimes we, we think that the moment you bill, you know, that's the moment the cash will be paid. I have noticed that in business and they've grown to understand that sometimes people take their time to pay. Um, and so it's very important that you manage, you know, cash flows, you know, very well. Don't be shy. Don't buy everything cash. As an entrepreneur, as you are on this journey to manage your cash flows very well, you might need to put in place facilities, credit facilities. Some of these big businesses that we've, we, we, we envy have been very good at cash flow management. You know, they even finance, they have people finance their big ideas. They don't just spend, you know, cash out, you know, from their pocket, but other people finance, um, you know, they, their ideas. So, you know, that's what I can say as far as cash flow is, is concerned, but most of the challenges really boil down, you know, to cash. Uh, thank you for that reminder that you must view early and uh, most of the challenges that we face as entrepreneurs is uh, when people take their time to pay uh, and uh, many people don't go down because probably they not worked on their mindset or they are not working hard but sometimes when people take their time to to pay it uh, really affects um, the business and you find yourself out of uh, business. Um, in uh, closing remarks, what lessons would you want to just share with us um, on how to be the lessons that you have learned on a journey on how that have helped me you to thrive or that are helping you to, to thrive? So lesson number one, Tafazo, I used to be an employee and I went into entrepreneurship. During my early days as an entrepreneurship, I didn't burn the bridges. I was saying to myself, if things get tough, maybe I should look for a job. So, so I was always in, in, in two mindsets. You know, one mindset which says, hey, I've got skills, I can always go back and, and, and work. But the, the first thing that I would want to say to entrepreneurs is that make up your mind. Uh, it's either you are an employee or you are an entrepreneur who creates wealth, who contributes to the acceleration of, you know, economic growth, who drives, you know, social change. You are not an employee, you know, anymore. And so it's very important that you bend the bridges, you know, so to speak, so that you are always, you know, going forward. Um, even when there are challenges, I have actually found out that somebody who has bent the bridges is more likely to continue going forward uh, in the face of challenges. Um, challenge number two, I mean, advice number two, always work on growth. Um, right from the day that I started my business, I set a head rate of growing every year by at least 100%. And you know, particularly in version four of Duplex Institute, 
we always are trying to grow. We budget for growth. We do every, everything that we do is growth oriented. And for that to happen, I have found myself having to work on the business rather than to work in the business. And there's a huge difference because there is no entrepreneur who will grow if they continue working in their business. So during a, you know, during a time of you know, your business, you may be working in your business. For example, I used to train and facilitate quite a lot. Now I'm hiring facilitators to be doing that. I'm thinking about strategy. Strategy is very important. When you are working on your business, it releases you to be able to do business development, to think strategically about how you can grow and establish the strategic you know, partnerships that you need um, in, your, in your business. And then advice number three, you know, if you are a small business, always operate with emergency funds. Um, your business will experience cash flow problems. It's very important that, you know, for the times that you are doing well, you don't spend all the cash and you are tempted to, you know, buy this luxury thing. Um, set, you know, save money for a rainy day. Always operate with emergency funds. Always, you know, you know deal with your bank um, in an ethical and with integrity in an ethical way and with integrity, play open books with your funders because these are the people that will bail you out when you are experiencing challenges. Um, I see that sometimes people run away from their you know, creditors uh, when things are going wrong. We must be able to confront the challenges and play open books. Integrity is very important uh, as an entrepreneur. You have to be believable. You have to be honest in your dealings with the people because that's how you're going to sustain you know, this business. And so one of the things that I have learned, even as far as managing cash flows is concerned, is that I have honored my word when it was necessary. And because I have honored my word when it was necessary, those people were able to bail me out because they knew that I was a man of his word. Be a person of your own word, um, especially when you've got money, because they will be a rainy day when you will need people to bail you out. And you know, one of the considerations before they bail you out is, are you a person of your word? Will you be able to pay up when you've got money or you will disappear with you know, that money? So be a person of your word. Um, I have had to make difficult decisions, Tafazo, such as I prioritize employee salaries before I pay myself um, because I realize that they are talent. I have made a commitment to them that I will pay them on a certain debt and, and I have kept my word. And it becomes very important that you become people, a person of your word, because even all these colleagues in your business and all these partners will actually be able to partner with you and be loyal to you based on how loyal you've been to them and how you've kept your word. So that's all I can say, Tafazo, at least for the time being. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Timba, for emphasizing on the integrity that we need to be entrepreneurs with integrity. Um, unfortunately, Precious could not join us today, but her book, Thriving Entrepreneurs, is available on Amazon and also in South Africa and in Zimbabwe. And I uh, would have loved if she had joined, but uh, well, thank you very much, Timba, for sharing your insights. We really benefited from that and uh, we look forward to, to thriving. Uh, if you want to get hold of Temba, you, you can get hold of him on uh, LinkedIn. You can look for Temba Mazubuko on LinkedIn. If you, you we also encourage you to just visit our website, www.tafazomazubukospeaks.co.za. You can check our online shop. You can check our blogs. And uh, if you want to get hold of us on our WhatsApp, our WhatsApp uh, number is on the page. 
Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I hope we have um, been inspired to move uh, from where you are to the next level. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Cheers.